People who move to New York always make the same mistake. They can't see the place. This is true of Manhattan, but even the outer boroughs, too. Be it Flushing Meadows in Queens or Red Hook in Brooklyn. They came looking for magic, whether evil or good, and nothing will convince them it isn't there here. This wasn't all bad, though. Some New Yorkers had learned how to make a living from this era in thinking. Charles Thomas Tester for one. The morning of most importance began with a trip from Charles' apartment in Harlem. He had been hired to make a delivery to a house out in Queens. He shared the crib in Harlem with his ailing father, Otis, a man who'd been dying ever since his wife of 21 years expired. They'd had one child, Charles Thomas, and even though he was 20, and exactly the age for independence, he played the role of dutiful son. Charles worked to support his dying dad. He hustled to provide food and shelter and a little extra to lay on a number from time to time. God knows he didn't make any more than that. A little after 8 a.m., he left the apartment in his gray flannel suit. The slacks were cuffed but scuffed, and the sleeves conspicuously short. Fine fabric, but frayed. This gave Charles a certain look, like a gentleman without a gentleman's bank account. He picked the brown leather brogues from it with nicked toes, then the seal brown trooper hat instead of the fedora. The trooper hat's brim showed its age and wear, and this was good for his hustle too. Last he looked last he took the guitar case, essential to complete the look. He left the guitar itself at home with his bedridden father. Instead he carried only a yellow book, not much larger than a pack of cards. As Charles Thomas Tester left the apartment on West 144th Street, he heard his father plucking at the strings in the back bedroom. The old man could spend half a day playing the instrument and singing along to the radio at his bedside. Charles expected to be back home before midday, his guitar case empty and his wallet full. Who's that writing? His father sang. Voice hoarse, but the more lovely for it. I said, who's that writing? Before leaving, Charles sang back the last line of the chorus. John the, Relev the, John the Revelator. <laughs> we'll see how many flubs I get while reading this out loud. He was embarrassed by his voice. Not tuneful at all. At least when he compared it with his dad's. In the apartment, Charles Thomas Tester went by Charles, but on the street, everyone knew him as Tommy. Tommy Tester, always carrying a guitar case. This wasn't because he aspired to be a musician. In fact, he could barely remember a handful of songs, and his singing voice might be described kindly as wobbly. His father, who'd made a living as a bricklayer, and his mother, who'd spent her life working as a domestic, had loved music. Dad played guitar, and mother could really stroll on a piano. It was only natural that Tommy Tester ended up drawn to performing, the only tragedy being that he lacked talent. He thought of himself as an entertainer. There were others who would have called him a scammer, a swindler, a con. But he never thought of himself this way. No good charlatan ever did. <laughs> In the clothes he'd picked, he sure looked the part of the dazzling, down-and-out musician. He was a man who drew notice and enjoyed it. He walked to the train station as if he were on his way to play a rent party alongside Willie the Lion Smith. And Tommy had played with Willie's band once. At their single song, Willie threw Tommy out. Yet yeah, Tommy toted the guitar case like the businessman proudly carrying the briefcase off to work now. The streets of Harlem had gone haywire in 1924, with blacks arriving from the South and the West Indies. A crowded part of the city found itself with more folks to accommodate. Tommy Tesser enjoyed all this just fine. Walking through Harlem first thing in the morning was like being a single drop of blood inside an enormous body that was waking up. Brick and mortar elevated train tracks and miles of underground pipe. The city lived. Day and night it thrived. How are we doing so far? Move this over here. Tommy took up more room than most because of the guitar case. At the 143rd Street entrance, he had to lift the case over his head while climbing the stairs to the elevated track. The little yellow book inside thumped, but didn't weigh much. He rode all the way down to 57th Street, and there transferred to the Roosevelt Avenue Corona line of the BMT. It was the second time going out to Queens, the first being when he'd taken the special job that would be completed today. 
The farther Tommy Tester rode into Queens, the more conspicuous he became. Far fewer Negroes lived in Flushing than in Harlem. Tommy bumped his hat slightly lower on his head. The conductor entered the car twice, and both times he stopped to make conversation with Tommy. Once to ask if he was a musician, knocking the guitar case as if it were his own, and the second time to ask if Tommy had missed his stop. The other passengers feigned his interest, even as Tommy saw them listening for his replies. Tommy kept the answer simple. Yes, sir, I play guitar. And no, sir, got a couple more stops still. Becoming unremarkable, invisible, compliant. And these were useful tricks for a black man in <clears throat> These were useful tricks for a black man in an all white neighborhood. Survival techniques. At the last stop, Main Street, Tommy Tester got off with all those others, Irish and German immigrants mostly, and made his way down to street level, a long walk from here. The whole way Tommy marveled at the broad streets and garden apartments. Though the borough had grown modernized greatly since its former days as Dutch and British farmland, to a boy like Tommy raised in Harlem, all this appeared rustic and bewilderingly open. The open arms of the natural world worried him as much as the white people, both so alien to him. When he passed whites on the street, he kept his gaze down and his shoulders soft. Men from Harlem were known for their strut, a lion's stride. But out here he headed away. <clears throat> he was surveyed, but never stopped. His foot shuffling the skies helped up climb. And finally, amid the blocks and blocks of newly built garden apartments, Tommy Tester found his destination. A private home, small and nearly lost in a copse of trees. The rest of the block taken up by a mortuary. The private place grew like a tumor on the house of the dead. Tommy Tester turned up the walkway and didn't even have to knock. Before he'd climbed three steps, the front door cracked open. A tall, gaunt woman stood in the doorway, half in shadows. Ma At. That was the name he had for her, the only one she answered to. She'd hired him like this, on this doorstep, through a half-open door. Ward had traveled to Harlem that she needed help, and he was the type of man who could acquire what she needed. Summoned to her door and given a job without being invited in. The same would happen now, he understood, or could at least guess, at the reason. What would the neighbors say if this woman had Negroes coming freely into her home? Tommy undid the latch of the guitar case and held it open. Ma At leaned forward so that her head peeked out into the daylight. Inside lay the book, no larger than the palm of Tommy's hand. Its front and back covers were solo yellow. Three words had been etched on both sides. Zig, zag, zig. Tommy didn't know what the words meant, nor did he care to know. He hadn't read this book, never even touched it with his bare hands. He had been hired to transport the little yellow book, and that was all he'd done. It had been the right man for his task, in part because he knew he shouldn't do any more than that. A good hustler isn't curious. A good hustler only wants his pay. Ma Ant looked from the book, there in the case, and back to him. She seemed slightly disappointed. You weren't tempted to look inside, she asked. I charge more for that, Tommy said. She didn't find him funny. She sniffed once, that's all. And then she reached into the guitar case and slipped the book out. She moved so quickly the book hardly had a chance to catch every, even a single ray of sunlight. But still, as the book was pulled into the darkness of Maat's home, a faint trail of smoke appeared in the air. Even glancing contact with daylight had set the book on fire. She slapped at the cover once, snuffing out the spark. Where did you find it? she asked. There's a place in Harlem, Tommy said, his voice hushed. It's called the Victoria Society. Even the hardest gangsters in Harlem are afraid to go there. It's where people like me trade in books like yours, and worse. Here he stopped. Mystery lingered in the air like the scent of a scorched book. Ma Hatt actually leaned forward as if he'd landed a hook into her lip. But Tommy said no more. The Victoria Society, she whispered. Uh, how much would you charge to take me in? Tommy scanned the old woman's face. How much might she pay? He wondered at the sum, but still, he shook his head. I'd feel terrible if you got hurt in there, I'm sorry. Ma Ant watched Tommy test her, calculating how bad a place this Victoria Society could be. 
After all, a person who trafficked in books like the little yellow one in her hand was hardly the frail kind. My aunt reached out and tapped the mailbox, affixed to the outside wall, with one finger. Tommy opened it to find his pay, two hundred dollars. He counted through the cash right there, in front of her. Enough for six months' rent, utilities, food, and all. You shouldn't be in this neighborhood when the sun goes down, Ma Aunt sighed. She's, she didn't sound concerned for him. I'll be back in Harlem before lunchtime. I wouldn't suggest you visit there day or night. He tipped his cap, snapped the guitar case shut, and turned away from Ma Aunt's door. On the way back to the train, Tommy Tessa decided to find his friend Buckeye. Buckeye worked for Madame St. Clair, the numbers queen of Harlem. Tommy should play Ma Aunt's address tonight. If his number came up, he'd have enough to buy himself a better guitar case. Maybe his own, even, maybe even his own guitar.